Okay, so welcome to a Zoom version of the Tackle Box. Tonight we've got Rob. Say hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. <laughs> and we've got um, Michael, who we've had on before when it's come, when we've talked about Maroon. And tonight's special guest is John Orchick. And I think I pronounced that correctly. You got it. From um, Cop Shop and Prisoner and a whole lot of other Australian TV shows and movies. So welcome, Michael and John. In fact, oh, John, if I may say, I think your resume reads like a, a list of the classic TV shows of Australia. I really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of felt a bit unreal even at the time, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like meeting him is like meeting entertainment history. I mean, yeah, he was exactly. in number 96 doing things and my mother wouldn't let me watch. I'm going, I want to watch this show. All the boys <laughs> at school are talking about it. And he's I've, on it. I've, I've got the dubious, I've got the dubious record of having the first male kiss on Australian television. So <clears throat> really? Oh uh, my god. Me and Joe Hasher yeah. in number 96 in the in the movie version of it. Yeah. Which was that's another story. Don't worry yeah. about that. That's uh, we can do those wreck and tie things at another time. But I mean, yeah. Um, thank you. I I don't know you want to kick this off, Michael, but I have no idea how you actually got hold of me or why. Uh, I was sending you stuff a phone through, call uh... one day going, hey, my name is Michael Gray Griffith. I'm a writer from Perth and I've got this play that I think I'd like you to do. And I thought, well, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> well, I mean, we're good buddies now. But that was Thanks, it was it was it was Probably the most amazing and interesting thing that's happened to me in the last 20 years. I'm serious. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. Yeah, we, uh, so I wrote the play, uh, I think it was Sharaf. And, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you, you were talking about the hues, the shadows and the hues. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And we've moved on from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's gone off by itself. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, I, I, well, I write a lot of plays and we, we were just looking for, a, uh, a great actor to play this role. So I think that's how it started. And uh, and then we just met up for lunch and just really hit it off. I, I just like his spirit. Just really... In old 70s speak, I just dig him. And then you sent me Sharaf to read <clears throat> and I was just blown away by the play. And I went, you know, I haven't been in the theatre for nearly 40 years, I gave it all up way back when, oh, maybe 30 odd years, I, mean, I, I can't even remember now. But I, um, I said, oh, no, I'm bored with the theatre and this has brought me back to the theatre, I can tell you without any shadow of a doubt. Oh, and thanks. then um, Sharaf, I, I totally fell in love with, um, both as an actor and also um, as, as, as a director, I wanted to talk, we, we had a bit of a, Thing about that but anyway we're working and that's down the track that is a much bigger project but then mm. one day he sent me this place said i want you to read this um it's called real <clears throat> and i thought oh jesus all right i'll read it i read the play and i rang him i can't remember 11 30 at night or midnight yeah it was about 11 30 at night the phone rings <laughs> and, God. and i was killing myself laughing and i said you are yeah, <laughs> joking you cannot do this play but let me tell you, if another actor who was going to be playing Ken doesn't want to do it, I'm doing it. I'm here. I'm just great. And, and I said, and I was laughing. I said, you can't do this. I said, but you can because this just is so close to my psyche in that sense. And what goes on in the play is so close to my psyche and so close to... Um, what I'm thinking about out, out there in the world at the moment, which I think is just, um, it's going to come crashing down. And when it does, it's going to be very ugly. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and that's precisely the problem. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to diffuse the problem before it becomes too serious. And, and there are people who are really trying to, to, to ramp things up. And in some cases, I think in many cases, they're going to be among those who will, who will suffer the most. They seem to be the ones bent on bringing no, no it up. No doubt about that, Robert. I, I, I just, um, uh, as we spoke earlier, I've been through stuff. Um, but to me, the, the play has an important message. And to me, you know, you, you may find this a bit um, funny, Michael, but 
to me, in a funny kind of a way, the play uh, is really talking about conciliation. Mm. Because it's conciliation because if it goes on the way it is, there's only violence. Mm. That's true. That's true. This is yeah, it's hard because you don't want to give the end way of this play. Oh, I'm not. But, uh, I'm just saying. But uh, but the, it was very interesting the other day. I, I have these. Uh, we had the reading, and Natalie was there. But uh, these another couple turned up. One's called Liz, who's a, who actually drew the Wolves logo. She's a postie, and she tells it like it is. And she said, in the first five minutes, I was thinking this is boring. And and then she goes, oh, I've got to sit through the whole of this. And then she said, and then three or four minutes later, she was like this. And she was glued for the rest of the play. And she was like, holy shit. And uh, so that's what it does. It's a slow little burner that ticks over and you're thinking, what's going on here? And then, and then I was watching the audience because that's what I do in the reading. I mean, there wasn't much narration to do. And they were glued. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a great reading. It was really exciting. I, I'm really excited to get it up. And and John was terrific, you know. So was uh, the rest of the cast. But they they were they were really terrific. But I think the play itself does that. It's like, you know, I've got a school as you guys might know. Australian Film and Television Academy has been going for what 28 years now, mm. um, a long time. Um, that's another story. But one of the things I tell my students is never go to an audience make the audience come to you mm -hmm. in other words what michael did just then was i lent in mm. yeah. and once that happens they're hooked you drew everyone in with the narrative i think you say yeah yeah you draw them in and that's the and the play does that and I think eventually, obviously, in performance, the performances will also do that. Yeah, that's uh, a really exciting thing. <clears throat> and it's going to be something that um, maybe, um, I don't know, I don't think Yana's going to be bored, Michael. Let me tell you, what I have in mind, even in the first few minutes, that's not going to happen. Oh, um, look, she, she is, uh, I don't think most people wear, but she's the extreme. I like to bring people who are going to be brutal. Oh! oh. <laughs> I get them. If I get them interested in book, uh, uh, this, that's a great. That's great. You know, <laughs> brutal for brutality's sake is always fun, because mm. you know who they are, and therefore yeah. you go. Okay. I think she once wrote a. She, I, I keep her little Facebook posts, and I think one of her things was she saw another play. And she said, uh, "These guys do some really fucking good shit," and I thought that's great. <laughs> I love it. That's my. <laughs> no flowering, no explaining. That's it. <laughs> and no. uh, and she's this great artist. I mean, the wolves that she drew, I'd like a tattoo of that, you know. But I had a few people I had a few people along. I had a couple of people along who had spent a lot of time in LA, which I didn't tell you about, and that who were friends of mine and they um, they came out here and they they've been in the business a lot mm -hmm. and um I was hooked up with Emma and co when I went to LA and um, she came back and she said, take this play to America now, you'd kill them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And she said, you'd raise a lot of dust and there'd be a lot of blood flying around, but you'd kill them. Mm. So what sort of, what sort of timeframes are we looking at with the new play reel? Uh, when do you think we, uh, we'll, we well, might as see? As we get out of lockdown, we might start rehearsing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we were hoping to do it for the end of July. And that one of the reasons uh, we were interested in this interview uh, was the grant people uh, will not look at this play. In fact, I doubt very much if they, they, they get halfway through it, put it down, and then be washing their hands and going, yes. I didn't even touch it. All of it's scary, <laughs> isn't it? It's all of it. Yeah, scary. yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it would terrify them. And the yeah. thing is, that's why it was so interesting in the audience. I was thinking, who's going to be offended in the audience? No one was offended. They all loved it. And uh, and that's where you try to bring a diverse group. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the one person who didn't come, which is I, I told Natalie and John, was uh, a lady who reads all of my stuff. And, um, and she's a big fan of my stuff. She hates the play. She was really angry about it. 
because uh, I s imply in the piece that a woman would lie about being sexually molested. And she was saying, you cannot, you cannot put out the suggestion that a woman would lie about that. Well, and, um, if you want to talk about that topic. Which is why moment. you see the funding people are going to go, oh, yeah, yeah I, not mine. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's why the play is quite cheap to do. It's not actually, doesn't have much of a set. It's not, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's going to cost money, but it's, it's affordable to do. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a fight back. And it's not a fight back of saying all women would do it, but mm. even the woman who played that character said, well, it's, yeah, it's, it, some women would do it. It's possible. That's the story we have to tell. But I'm not saying that, that she is lying on the play. That's a part of the tension of the play. But the implication is that she could be. That's all. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, the fact is that that does happen, and I can tell you for a fact that it happens. Mm. And <clears throat> without no comment, question. <laughs> without it's, question. So a, a lot I, of men have have experienced something like that. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, you know, it's not just you find that when it happens to one person, suddenly the people come out of the woodwork, and you go, "Whoa, hang on a minute." Mm. Look, we've all done things in our lives that we don't want to do and don't want to talk about and might regret. All of us have. None of us haven't. If we have, we're lying. Um, I, I think... Uh, also, no big deal. I mean, no one suffered massively because of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Not for me, anyway. But to have well, someone think, accuse me, that's not a ball game. Yeah. I think so also, John, uh, a lot of the tension of the play is the impossible position uh, the main character is in where he's basically uh, been found guilty with no evidence. I mean, even when he goes to his lawyer, his lawyer suggests, well, the best thing to do is, is quit your job exactly. now, take a year exactly. off exactly. and just like vanish and then set up, because he's a real estate agent, set up somewhere else like Perth. You know, yeah. it's, it's actually saying, don't fight this, because if you fight it, you lose. If you win, you lose. And that's the thing. Is It's actually, and Craig McLaughlin said this in his uh, documentary, once the accusation's in, you're lost. And yeah. that's it. It's finished. And that's what this play uh, explores. So it's not, it's not really that important to whether it's truthful or not, it's the fact that this guy spends this one night trying to figure out what to do, where he's realizing um, it's judge, jury, executioner has all happened by society before before it, the accusation is even put in, before it's actually gone, become Ooh. legal. So he's got one night in the morning, uh, the girl's gonna make the uh, complaint official. So he's got one night to try save all he's worked for and all his life and everything like that. And that's well, the that, kind of tension of the play. It's also avarice versus avarice. Oh yeah, yeah. He's not, he's, he, yeah, there's, you know, he's, I, I didn't try to make it, oh, this is this poor, you know, innocent guy. This is, no, they're all, everyone's dirty, but it's like predators. All dirty, everyone's but, uh, dirty. But that makes it fun, you know? But, uh, and so also that makes you always wondering, is he, t which one's telling the truth? And that's also the tension and the fun of the players. Everyone's going, what's going on? You've got to wait to the last few moments to find out. So it's a judgment call on you. But underneath that judgment call, regardless of who's telling the truth or not, the comments that he makes that he's the accusation itself has finished him once it's, once it's made official, it's finished him, that's real. And that, yep, that's what the play's right. called, it's real. And that's real. We saw it with Craig McLaughlin. We saw it with Jeffrey Rush. Uh, Even though Jeffrey got a million dollars in compensation, all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's still huge. You know, there's uh, yeah, so it's it's a very 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 interesting and uh, yeah, so it's and that's I uh, mean that's not the only thing in the play, but that really holds the gripping tension of uh, you put. Uh, ordinary people in an extraordinary situation, in an extraordinary situation with a lot to lose, and well, who knows what will happen? And that's the point. That's absolutely that's true. ordinary people in, in extraordinary situation. Mm. Yeah.
It's absolutely fabulous, uh, Michael, that you're that you're that you're uh, looking at that and 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 having the courage to do that because, as you say, it makes a lot of people afraid. You're having problems with funding now, I believe, uh, because they're not wanting to to back it. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, Cassie J had this with the Red Pill documentary. It's about the men's rights movement. Um, she was uh, she had uh, funding until she realized until they, the funding uh, the backers realized that it was going to be an even handed. A look at men's rights and then all the funding evaporated so yeah, that's right that's right yeah which was crazy because that actually made me watch it i'd never heard of it it was all the controversy that said oh i'm gonna watch this thing well, I think the controversy, and uh, the controversy yeah yeah what it's all about isn't it really i mean i said to michael i remember many many years ago um uh adelaide festival i did a play called the maids jean Genet, and um we did a men's version of it, but it wasn't a gay version of it. Gay as in the sense of we're going to be camp and very funny because those versions of it had been played. This was going to be a very serious and ugly version of it. And my very good friend um, who directed it from Sydney, um, that's another story. But when we got to Adelaide, our bookings were for the festival. There were, um, yeah, okay. They weren't wonderful, but they were okay. You know, we were going to be all right. Anyway, there was, a, I don't know if they're still around, but there was a group called the Festival of Light. And the Festival of Light decided to hold a candlelight vigil. And um, at these three homosexuals from Sydney, they didn't know me, of course, and um, which is irrelevant, but my, my friends uh, who were, you know, were the three of us, I wasn't, but that's, and they held a candlelight vigil outside the theatre to protest the production of the play, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. We sold out the following day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you tell somebody they can't do something, they want to go and do it. We mm -hmm. sold out the following day. And I'm Alexander Hay, who was a very, very wonderful man and a great director and a great actor, was one of the founders of um, NIDA way back, used to teach way back in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And, and Alex directed it and, um, and he, was, he was terrific. Um, and I did a couple of plays with Alex, um, in fact, but it was just one of those things where, you know, suddenly if someone says, and I think what we want is real is for people to say, don't see this. That's mm. right. I want, I want people, <laughs> and that, that woman who hates it was, was great. There's uh, be the be some the woman, recently said something about marooned i don't know if you saw that on facebook natalie oh she yeah was, we talked about it last yeah. week and oh my god the the I, I just posted it the support back was amazing i th i actually said to her thing i said thank you very much i uh, just this misogynistic play and oh that's actually, thing actually yeah she said that ma the male white mature male voice is not welcome in australian theater anymore your stories are not the stories we should be telling anymore and oh. um, and it, it really helped. <laughs> and so there's two ways we can fund it. One is to find someone uh, who just wants to come on as uh, like an executive producer and back us. Uh, or two, uh, this week, uh, we'll be setting up a uh, cultural fund, uh, which we've used before to f uh, Filming Maroon, which we're about to do. Uh, and that every donation for that over $2 is 100% tax deductible. So the tax man is coming up, and if if you want to put some of your tax money into getting this play up, uh, we can got the Alex Theatre here, where the Wolves are a resident theatre company now. They they really support what we do. They've got the perfect theatre. John seen it, so it's a perfect theatre for say a yeah. two week season to start it off. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I think the controversy would really get talking, and then Sydney's just like, here we come. Yeah, and I think the controversy from Sydney, uh, from Melbourne, would just explode Sydney. I think oh, yeah. it would be it great fun. Can I just say, because I've seen like two of your plays now and the cast reading of Real, um, so I consider I've seen three of your plays, um, you have the ability to tap into the subjects that we don't talk about. Thanks. Natalie. And that's what makes it, like I've seen maroon three Boxy times. Taboo, Michael, which is really <laughs> she has, she has, she's a maroon groupie. Who ever yeah. thought a suicide play would get groupies? <laughs> like I, I saw, well, I saw it the first time with James on 
the um, march for the actual march that we did for Maroon and for yeah, right, yeah. um, prevention of suicide. And then I brought a couple of friends back the following week, not knowing that you knew one of my friends that I work with. And then, Charlie. yeah, Charlie. And then um, the night, the night I came to see real, it was like, I just tagged along and then just jumped in the car with you guys and said, right, I'm coming to see Marooned again. And I was like sitting there in the car buying my tickets on, on my phone as I was coming in. But I have seen, I have seen Marooned three times. I was um, supposed to see it a week ago, but couldn't get yeah. it. It was, but... um, I, I, I saw um, Magnolia Tree a couple of weeks ago. You have the ability to touch on, as, as John said, those taboo subjects that we all don't want to talk about, but we all have in the back of our head. And Thanks. when you walk out of each of these plays, um, it has us asking questions, even in, into ourselves, it, you know, I came to see um, real by myself. So I had no one to bounce. Like I, had, I didn't have a friend to bounce my thought process off. And you, I was able to, to digest it differently. And, but, and I'm looking, this is why I call myself your stalker is because I am looking forward to the other plays you're, you're going to write in the future and that you have written and we're hoping to get up and running just for the simple fact is, as I know, it's going to be a taboo subject. You have brought me back to the theater. You have brought the writing that I've been wanting to do for ages out in me that, you know, I've even started my own Facebook blog page that so when I do go out and I do go to the theater, I can actually record it down because when I, you see me, when I do put a review up, it's like 10 pages long. It's Tolstoy. <laughs> and, but you brought that out of me. Like you, well, you awakened something that I thought was just all in my head. John, um, when I saw you, as I said, before we started re tonight is you, you had one thing in your hand, just one little insignificant thing, and you brought the character to life. Like, you made them human, and you made them, um, pardon the pun, you actually made your character, Ken, beyond real, be just for this simple, insignificant little thing in your hand. And that was during a reading. That was just yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, dream. Robert. It was, and there's this one, there's this one little line in the whole play that's Ken's line near the end. It's 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 just before the third act, and the whole play is basically designed to getting to this re realization that Ken suddenly has to realize what's happening that he's been sold this uh, this this thing. I don't want to say what it is. But even in the reading, John, I was watching John. I thought, "Oh my God, we get this on stage. That's going to be, I'm, it's, it's going to be such a moment. It's uh, and it's all there, it's building up and building up. And you know it's coming. But even when you know it's coming, you think, I can't believe they're doing what they're doing. You know, so yeah. yeah so it's going to be, it's going to be really cool. And and on another point, um, uh, we have another the shadows and the hues that I talked to John about. Uh, Bruce Beresford's come online now, so he's directing that one in sale. So there is a lot happening. So if there was a producer out there who was thinking, well, maybe I've got some money, I want to see if I could make some money as well, I think Real has the chance through controversy of really filling theatres and really touring. And even like John said, America, I think there's, I think there's real legs in this piece. And what's interesting too is there's two female characters in the very, very strong female characters. One of them is incredibly strong and every uh, actress that reads it goes nuts for it. So it's, uh, it's, it's not just um, bad it's men and this role. women are bad thing. There's just strong characters. So it's, it's, it's got a very strong female presence the as female well. So it's not, are very strong you know, characters and they're good. Oh, they're yeah, good. yeah. And, and they're not, they're not just bound by 
simple boundaries. They have complexities in them. Lang mm. is complex, really, even though on the surface it appears Lang is just merely um, out there to make a buck and to totally fuck the system in, in many ways and make use of it. Um, Monica, on the other hand, is not going to let this happen. It's kind of like um, Arnie Schwarzenegger versus Arnie Schwarzenegger in many ways. Um, even though they don't know the fact that they are battling against each other, they are, but it's that unknown quantity in the middle that once Lang realises who the real adversary is, mm. it's too late. Yeah, well, that's right. So we had one of the, the little blurbs was not Australia, nothing brings out the killer in you, like the arrival of an apex predator. <laughs> and, and that literally is it, you know, so it's, uh, I, th I think it's really interesting. And, and I'm just confident by the feedback. Well, Natalie was there, the reading, the audience loved it. Yeah. You know, I don't think there was, was one person in the house that, and I mean, I, I think I have to go back to like the very, very stream, even before the play started, how you open the play was <laughs> amazingly original. Like it was, yeah, it was they, uh, yeah. what, they, what they do is they auction a church. because it, So it's, it's set in a dying town where two real estate agents, Ken and his son, Ben, and Ben has managed to sell over half the town. We don't know who to. And the play starts at the moment, literally 10 minutes after he sold the church. He's auctioned the church. He was he was baptized in, uh, Chris, you know, uh, married in married twice. 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 <laughs> the first one was an audition. And then, uh, and so he's done that. And so what they did, we did it for fun, and we're going to keep it in the play now, is they start with this auction. And people in the audience can auction anything except money. And so we had people offering their daughters and their husbands and, and those, it was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. But, and it started like a bit stayed at first and then suddenly people were getting into it. And I was thinking, you get a real audience and you don't know what you're going to get. And suddenly everyone's fired up and then we're straight into the play. It's really cool. It, and it, that's part of the originality of it. It's like part of the originality with Magnolia Tree where at the end, it's up, it's up to the audience to decide the ending, yeah. not you as the writer. Um, and Maroon, well, let's not even go there. We already know I'm a fan. <laughs> you know, I think I, I still cannot look at certain characters. Mr. Kane, Mr. <laughs> yeah. Gregory Kane. <laughs> Greg Kane kills me. Um, exactly. But... As I said before, that you have this ability to tap into the the human psyche, and we we was like, no, 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 we don't want to hear about this, la 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 la. But inside us, we're intrigued, and it it brings you forward. If we want to know what these characters are doing, even the ones we hate, we want to walk up to them and bitch slap them. Yeah, John's character Ken. I wanted to walk up and give him a hug and protect him. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was. That's what you brought out, and I mm. think it, it, it's very hard to bring that out in people. And you somehow know, or another, the... um, you managed to, you managed to do it. It was the same in Magnolia Tree, actually. No offense to Rowana, I actually wanted to bitch slap her in Magnolia Tree, um, and but you, you you did the same thing with um, Toddy Goldsmith in Magnolia Tree. Is you had a tissue up her sleeve, and it was like that is such a human thing to do is have a tissue up your sleeve. That wasn't me. That was her. But yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's what I mean. It's like instead of just ad addressing them. It's just this tiny, tiny little thing that makes them human. And going back to Marooned, um, and it was the difference with the cast, with um, when Chris played 
the tough guy in Maroon, I, I wanted to go up and hug him and protect him and go, I could see this soft side in him. And I'm sorry, I've forgotten the new guy's name that plays that character. Darren, Darren Moore. Darren. Um, I found that I was more like, I know you, you're tough, you're on your own. But they both brought out different emotions of the same character. Hmm. Well, is it, what, I, what I love about theatre, to be honest, um, is especially the, the script's only the starting point. And uh, I'm lucky because um, I get to work with really great actors and mm -hmm. I'm working with better and better artists all the time. And, and they bring all this stuff to it. So it's, it becomes very communal. It, be, it becomes a, a very communal act, you know. Uh, Maroon, we always bouncing things off each other. Magnolia is the same. Uh, John and I have been doing it uh, a bit with Sharaf and uh, and um, and Real. It's and I really enjoy it. And what happens is, it's a really strange experience. Is that people suddenly communally come together and they want to tell the one story. And I think as long as everybody knows what the story is they're telling, we're all telling the same story. That's very, very exciting. And if the actors are getting goosebumps on in rehearsal, then I find when uh, it goes to stage, that, tra that translates to the audience being affected as well. So that's what I love about it. And, uh, and I'm just this part of a thing, you know, I'm just lucky because I sort of start the beat and then the others come on. You know, you know what I, I mean? Think, I mean, you're right. You're right, Michael, in that point of view. I mean, I also think that, you know, I had this argument the other day with someone that I, really drives me on the bill. She's too young anyway, because I can't feel it. And I said, I don't care what you feel. What do you want the audience to feel? Mm. Uh, you don't matter. Mm. And they go, what do you mean? I said, you don't matter. It's mm. not your job. Mm. Your job is to tell the story. In telling the story, you make the audience go through a certain process. I think it was, um, 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 I'm trying to think, um, it was um, oh, American writer, sadly no longer with us, also an actor, very good actor. Anyway, Sam Shepard. Um, Sam, Shepard. Sam, Shepard. Sam Shepard, who said that to him, the theatre is never the telling of a story. The theatre is an experience for the audience to walk out of. Mm. And I, I kind of find that a very, very interesting statement. In other words, you may have entered that theater or that hall or that whatever, but you don't walk out the same. No. <clears throat> and, and that to me is what it's about. And I'm, I'm sorry, but for the last 20 odd years, I've not seen anything that I've wanted to do. And yes, Michael Chekhov was wonderful and so is and, and, and Anton rather and all the rest of it, but we've been there, done that, and I've done that, and I'm bored with all that shit now. And I'm not bored with Shakespeare because that's something you can never get bored with, I don't think, for me anyway. But for a lot of the other so-called classics, you go, ho-hum, this is kitchen sink drama now. Television does it better, in fact. See, I so thought it was just me. I thought I'd lost my passion or I'd grown, you know, uh, I growing up I'd had kids my brain is elsewhere I thought it was all this that um no, I thought having an experience. Wasn't real but I mean, you stopped having an experience yeah. the theater is about going in and having an experience not about sitting back and going oh it was that wonderful darling <laughs> yeah no I was finding it very redundant that going to the theater was like I thought the plays themselves were redundant and then coming out of it I'm thinking oh it's just me because I've got this on my mind or this on my plate but I think you're right I think for the last 20 or 30 odd years um the theatre has sort of been dormant and I, I said like video killed the radio star it killed a lot more because anything and everything was all of a sudden freely available yeah, except the radio star is now reborn <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I think COVID's actually the one of the great things that COVID's done is now instead of choosing to go out whenever we want, we're wanting to go out because we can't. 
So we want to go back to the movies. We want to go back to the theatre. We want to go back and experience all these things. And, you know, my goal is just as an amazing we also, we also want to go to somewhere where we know we're going to experience something. Yes. And not just go through the motions. This is, you know, um, it's something that I think that we want to walk out and talk about. Can I tell you, I mean, way back when I was really at the MTC in all those early days, David Williamson was just kicking off and um, and the pram factory was happening around the corner and I was at the MTC and the day we went off to, and that was a very exciting time in the theatre because there was a whole bunch of new writers, there were a whole bunch of new thoughts, <clears throat> there were a whole bunch of new things that were happening. And I think literally since probably the mid seventies, that's been the ball game. Nothing much has really happened. Now, I did Siren, David's play many, many years later, um, which we opened here in Melbourne at the uh, Athenaeum and then toured around Australia, Perth and a couple of other major cities. Um, but by then I felt that, that his, his writing by then, uh, it was kind of over. I then directed, um, the Removalists in Sydney at the Parramatta Riverside Theatres um, with a fantastic cast. And um, that really went quite well. And David came out to see it and whatever. But by then, to me, that was like, that was now a historical piece that I was doing. It was no longer something new, vital, something exciting, something that made people argue in the street. Oh, Rhea will do that. <laughs> it's my point. That is exactly my point, Michael. We were in uh, Gasworks. Robert, uh, Magnolia Tree is about a family putting the mother in a nursing home and the brother suggests that they kill her and he, because he's a real estate agent as well, he tries to convince his sisters to well, do you it. you got to get real estate agents. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and at the, uh, at the end of Act um, 2, uh, one of the daughters leaves to do it and the audience has to vote to whether she does it or not. Um, but it's been on about 50 times now and death's winning by two shows. Uh, uh, yeah, so basically, and it's murder. It's very clear that it's murder. And in the, in the tour we just had, uh, the Alex Theatre, uh, we did the Alex Theatre, uh, they voted life. And then I think every show after that, was has been death. It's been four deaths. We've never had four death things in a row, and oh, an overwhelming yeah. death. But when we were in Ga when we were in uh, Potato Shed in Geelong, uh, and I facilitate the vote, the, the the people that were voting death were getting hissed at by the people voting life. <laughs> they were going, push your hand down, push your hand down. <laughs> they were glaring at them. I saw people hitting other going. Push your just put your hand down. It was this. And I was just sitting up at the front going, Very this emotive. is fucking awesome. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I just loved it. And uh, and then it's, they they talk forever. They, uh, Ezra Bix, who uh, was in that play, he's been doing plays for 40 years. He says he's never seen a play where you come out and all the audience is talking about is the play. And they talk for hours, which way to vote, this way, this way, because there's all these different issues. But that's what I, I love it. That's that's Fantastic. such a buzz, and uh, and I think real is going to get some serious arguments happening. There'll yeah. be people going, "Oh, this, this," and I think there'll be people who've basically been very quiet in this long period, suddenly going, "Well, actually, uh, no." And so I think it could be uh, a very interesting uh, time after the play in the pub or in the foyer. Could be very interesting. Might have to wear a flat jacket. But there's, uh, but I think I really believe the theatre and this particular theatre, not all theatre, but some theatre has to really rock the boat. And that's what I like about John, because when I met John, he was like, oh, yeah, he's got to fucking rock the boat. And I was thinking, thank you. And so that's what I'm interested in. So you come and see Real, we can get this funded. I mean, we're not going to rock it. The chance I'm going to sink it. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it has that in its balls to do, you know. And I really do. It, really will, cause, it will cause a massive thing. You know, the thing mm -hmm. about it is that you don't ever state she never actually goes through with it, you see. 
she never gets a chance to. We always assume she's going to go and make this complaint. We don't know that she's ever really going to. We make that assumption. She's playing a game. But then I think everyone's going to jump to that conclusion. I think your timing yeah, is perfect. They'll, they'll jump to the conclusion depending on where they politically sit. Totally, exactly. That, that's where because it goes. That's what go happens. There. Yeah, that's what happens with Magnolia Tree as well. A lot of people who've put their parents in nursing homes actually vote vote for murder. The ones that have actually been through the nursing home process vote for death. And they and that's when they people go, how do they vote? The ones who haven't. So it's uh, yeah, so it's really interesting. Yeah. I have to I have to say with Magnolia Tree being part of the audience at the Alex, I found that a lot of people that voted for life were like older people, like in the sixties. Hmm. So it was sort of like, no, I'm voting for me to live because my kids are thinking are going to be, my kids are going to be thinking of that in like ten or fifteen years of putting me into a nursing home. That's really what it looks I like. To, I don't want to cement it. Yeah, cement the idea. No, I want to live no matter what. <laughs> so yeah so it's yeah it's interesting I, I, that's what i love about theater though and i love theater that it's you come out and and there are the people it's it's a very i mean films are great and i, I watch films all the time but you sit a film i watch it by myself and then i'm here by myself or i walk out of a cinema by myself that's it you don't talk to anyone else but theaters for some reason theater is different and if you do it right suddenly You've got a foyer it full of people. It is different train. because there is an energy happening on the stage which yeah. translates to the energy happening in the auditorium. Now, yeah. that doesn't always happen, I can tell you. But when it does <laughs> happen, when those energies collide, and I mean they have to collide, they don't have to be in sync, they have to collide. And as that's collision that causes that kind of excitement and that kind of, wow, let's talk about this and let's argue about this and let's even fight about it in the streets. Yeah. I mean, the, th the phone call from John, I still, I love it. He's, so he's calling up and he's just giggling on the phone going, you can't do this. And I did have another very esteemed actor who I couldn't believe doing it, but I actually, I just felt that John uh, or sick or sick was, or, was better, but or sick and or sick or sick. I got it right. Oh, she uh, was better suited for this particular role. And uh, so we're, we're going that way. But but he hasn't been the only one. I did actually ask people, uh, other people who work with us, you know, do you want to read, see? Well, so many of them were calling me up going, oh, my God. You know, so that is in the play to do. So it's, it's a really interesting way. If you want to get men's issues out there, it's a really interesting way to do it. Because you're doing, you know, two, three hundred people, maybe four hundred people at a time, you know, people who are into theatre, a lot of intellectual people. It's right in there. People are talking. The media's talking. It's a very good way to do it, and it's entertainment. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's it's not this where if you set up a placard, they're all going to turn away. And this this is a very interesting way. That's the same way with Maroon James, who we worked with in uh, Corowa, was right. He said Maroon is like a uh, Trojan horse of male issues. It deals with male suicide and female suicide, but in its, in its bowels, there's uh, a lot of talking about the disconnection of men, the devaluation, devaluation, whatever that would, however you say that word. Uh, so there's a lot of issues in there. And, I, and that's also why the funding bodies are a bit funny with Maroon, do you know what I mean? And, but the army's that's touring. Too. And that says yeah, a lot that's too. A, yeah, and that's heading off to the United Kingdom. They're, they're finishing their one of their massive national suicide conferences with it. Uh, we're coming to Brisbane to see you if we COVID lets us out. Uh, and we can't find a theatre. We've just got the conference and we're really having trouble finding a theatre. It's driving us nuts. And, Have you had a uh, night up there? What's Is that? Night still going around? So I don't know. We're fine. In Queensland, um, we've been fine for a long time, probably since mid-2020. Yeah. We've had yeah, no, no, I'm is Twelfth Night Theatre still going? Oh, um, actually, that's a really good question. Um, that's that's a very well-known theatre up here. I think they're still going, actually. Uh, so, yeah. um, Michael up, and I did talk... still there and... and um, yeah. Michael and I did talk about a few options, um, and I think he's, he's, he's looked into those, but, yeah, I think... About that's a 300-seater. Really... 
Charles Knight, it's really good. Yeah, you know, I think it may still be going, actually. That's something we'll look into. Yeah, Yeah, well, I've got nothing to do at the moment, so I'll get back onto it. And then, uh, and now the Army's touring it, which they they really have an issue with because Mm. you've got the backing of this huge organisation who want marooned, and they tell me the only reason they want it marooned is it doesn't switch people off. Yep. The, they're serving soldiers actually watch it and get moved by it, and that's what they want. Everything else they try, that's what they told me. They people switch off, and it's not really inter- it's not really connecting. So it's it's in a very interesting point, and, and I'm trying to show people the power of theatre, and I think real has that ability to really challenge challenge something that's going on in theatre now. Do it cheaply economically and powerfully and yeah and you can't stop it because we don't need millions of dollars to do this you know and michael i just want to just want to say that um that i think that uh, your timing with real is absolutely perfect without giving anything away in, in terms of plot or anything there's stuff going on in the in the news at the moment that's going to be going on over the next few years oh god has it ever exactly and it's really on point i think um, the other point I wanted to make, too, uh, in regards to Marooned, uh, you mentioned the UK, which I think you had mentioned to us before. Yeah. Um, I don't know how far developed that is, but we've got uh, connections over in the UK, and I'll put you in touch with a few people over there who might be able to, to give yeah, you a Yeah, great. So it's a National spot. Suicide Prevention Conference, and they're wrapping it up with a, uh, a reading of Marooned cast by the National Theatre. Right. Um, and, but they're making it, I believe they're going to make it an English show not going to make an Australian. So the big guy's going to be played by a Scottish guy. Right, you know, adapted. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, that's okay. yeah, yeah, work. Of Scottish people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Marooned. Perfect. Marooned. yeah, we've read Marooned in English accents like Lock, Stop, Two Smoking Barrels. It's funny as shit. It is so funny. So, um, yeah, so look, I'm really excited. I'm just excited to be working with John. I really am. I mean, Sharaf is, is a really exciting piece and, and we're oh, doing an online okay. thing of that now. But, but I think real... Um, could just be surprising. You get people going, have you heard about this play? I mean, it's, it's just like this little rebel play that's going on and you can't get in, you know? And, um, and I think that's a, it's a very interesting way um, because I'm not interested in putting women down, but I do think men need to stand up. And I think theatre, Maroon, that's why I'm always hitting the men's groups going, come and see this play. Because I was told when I pitched it to a theatre by a major woman in theatre, she said, you don't write plays for men. That's what she said, men don't care. And then so when, and what she means is just men don't care. What she actually meant is we don't care about men. That's what she actually meant. And so when this woman posted the other day, uh, male white stories aren't welcome. We don't want to in the Australian theatre anymore. She, and people saying, oh, who's this person? No, she is speaking for a lot of people. And you see that in the grants, I mean, there was a grant submission that I've seen and you're going, you know, are you this, 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 this? this?" there's only one box missing, men. Are you a man? Are you male? Not there. Who are you aiming your play at? Every other demographic, not men. And that's true. People who who advocate identity politics, they use the Mm. language of inclusion, but they're really talking about exclusion. Totally. Yeah, that's right. Totally And and, and that's why I think... The way to fight back is to, if this is a very interesting way to fight back, go and fight. We'll put on our own plays, like the Blacks sang jack mu- jazz music in America. We'll get, we'll get our own art up, and the art's good, and we're filling theatres, and so, you know, go, go whatever. <laughs> and so I think that's a very, very uh, proactive, positive way to, to fight back. And the fact that there's very strong female characters in this shows that we're not actually a play about just putting women down, we're just rocking the boat. And we have some very, very strong points that we think are worth discussing. And the characters are real. Like you mm. you see, you either identify with a certain character or you know that character in your personal life. Mm. So th- that's the difference. It's not the... F- he, he, you're right, Michael. You're definitely not putting women down. And as I said, I've seen three of your productions now. You're actually showing very real characters. Like these men, men and women. Like you see them. Like, you know, I'll, I'll pick on John for a minute. You could see that um, fatherly love 
when he was reading him and he was talking to his son and his daughter-in-law that you, you you could see you could see that grandfather thing you wanted to go up and hug him you want to mm. go up and hug the character so it's not a matter of these are all fairy tale characters saying the perfect thing these are real life situations and these are real life people that you know and that you can identify with because you can go yeah that's somebody i work with yeah that's my best mate yeah that's my kid that's my mom you know these people Mm. i I think that's very true natalie i think you identify or you have a point of identification with everybody there really for me these characters are everyday characters. You know, many, many years ago, I remember when I was starting in the theatre and there was a definition of what, what is a tragedy. And it could only ever involve the leaders of the countries. In other words, it could only ever involve kings or queens or prime ministers. Mm. That was a tragedy. Mm. And along came Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. And yeah. suddenly everybody talked a tragedy and they said no that can't be a tragedy it doesn't involve a head of state of somebody yeah. who <laughs> whose whose actions whose motions change the world but in many ways i think that real and the characters in this are the willie lomans of today mm. in other words we have a whole new thing that says and it's not about putting women down at all what it is about is putting down the women who want to put down the men Interesting. Well, it, it, that's the same happens in Maroon. One six two zero, I see as a modern tragic character. That's that's what he is. He he, he turns up in this suicide prevention play. He turns up broken, um, and, and I won't get into it. But that's that's what he is. He he is a, a modern tragic man. A man who's tried to do everything that he thinks is right, and here he is broken because it's you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I love my tragedies. But then so does God. Not that I think that I've got, but God loves his tragedies, so why can't a little playwright, you know? <laughs> tragedies, mate, so do you. He likes his comedies too, but he loves his tragedies. <laughs> now, Michael, yeah. you mentioned about we're able to do tax-deductible donations for real and for the other plays as well, I think. Is that right? No, no, for, we, we set them up. I mean, it would take us a few days to set up. Uh, and then it's like anything over two dollars is one hundred percent tax deductible. Tax deductible, yeah. and so this week uh, we could get it up to, and get back in contact and send you the link. And I think that would be a very interesting way. And I think if we could fund it that way, like based on this show, and they see that it's getting funded, that could really upset a lot of people because f- controlling the funding is one way that they suppress voices. Because the only voices that get up that are the ones they fund. That's very true. Mm. That's right. That's right. And so if suddenly this thing is getting funded, uh, especially from a group that they, because what, what I said to this woman who said, you don't write plays for men, I actually said to her, well, maybe you're not writing plays for men that men want to see. You know, my thing is that why should men come pay $75, $100 to come and see a play that basically says it's all your fault. Mm. You know, why do that? They get enough abuse from the normal they, world. Why pay they for get it? that everywhere, exactly. That's right. That's right. So, so Maroon celebrates a beauty and nobility of men in this lost male voice. That's why I think, uh, and what surprises me about it is how much women love it, mm-hmm. you know? So, <laughs> so, yeah, they really do. It's got a huge female fan base, you know what I mean? I mean, our the head chairman... Well, the chairperson of our board came, took over the board of the Wolves simply because she saw Marooned in a pub and she sees plays all the time. Right. And she walked out stunned and said, that's the best play I've seen in, in decades. Perfect. And then she uh, she became the head of our board. She says, I want to help you grow. You guys are great. So it's, and that's, you know, and so I think this is a really interesting position we're in. COVID is one of the biggest on again, at the moment. At the Alex. Uh, yeah. Almost that was cancelled happening. We're supposed to be in Launceston this weekend, so we're supposed to do two shows. So that's moved to August. Um, at the moment, it's Brisbane. We're not sure what's happening with the Alex yet. Uh, he has postponed it for a few weeks, but they just extended our lockdown for a week, and 
I think once the lockdown finishes, I think the people will be a little bit sus for a week. So we're in a strange, strange place. Mm. And, it was really uh, heavily booked. When I booked. When I booked tickets for it, it was pretty well booked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does well. It, 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 it attracts a good audience. And hopefully not everyone, so we've so, you know, we'll put it back on so those people still have it. And um, and it, it does well, you know. I think the last time I was on at the Alex, it did two houses. It, it did really well, and it's got a good following. And it's got if you get on Facebook, there's loads of people selling it. You know what I mean? So, and the Sydney Morning Herald did this extraordinary review where they said it's a play that must be seen, and these voices must be heard. So it's it's getting traction from it, you know. And oh, did you uh, that review to that woman. Uh, I didn't get back to her. No, I th I don't want to. I thought maybe she might come see another play, do another good one. <laughs> I try to stay away from critics, reviewers. <laughs> you know, I, you, you know, try. You know, it's uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Harriet, something. Her name's there. So um, yeah, but it's but that's interesting. But I do I do think there's a big time now and i think i see it on the men's groups because i'm a i'm a well I, I i join them i'm not active but i use them for promoting what we're doing and i and i think it is a time for us just to go no look the women did it when we were young when they started the feminist movement and they did and and now it's the time for the men to stand up we're here we're 50 percent of the population what's our part in it what's this and come up because at the moment um the thing that I get concerned about is what does it take to be a man now is not actually being discussed by men. You know what I mean? And we wouldn't have a discussion about what do we think women should be, you know, no, you know, it'd be an outcome. Yeah, spoken to a lot. A yeah, lot of to yeah. Men. And it's, so it's time for us, I think, to take our own power. And that doesn't mean putting down other people, but it's standing up in this. And I also, a big advocate, I put up a big thing which caused a big stir to say in the Black Lives Matter to say, okay, you're black, but I'm actually, I'm white, I'm mature, I'm a white mature male. I come from a long history of white mature, white people. And so there was other colored people in there. I wouldn't care, I wouldn't bother, fine, I'd be celebrating that too. I just don't happen to be that. I'm Welsh Irish and I'm proud to be white. And man, that was really that was a really interesting post. But if so, I was if I was black, I could say I'm proud to be black. I'm proud to be Chinese. Like, why is it not an issue? Why can't I say I'm proud to be white? It's not racist. I am, and I still am. And so there's a lot of things like that that I'm very I think need to be talked about. And so to be an independent playwright, which is what I am, uh, it allows me the freedom. No one can say, look, if you say that, we're going to sack you. Uh, which when I was a tram driver, I, they wanted me to write, read poetry out on the ABC um, radio station. They hadn't done that for years. Uh, and I was writing about Melbournians and the, and the Yarra Trams was going to sack me. They said, you go on that show, you're sacked. And a QC lawyer wrote a letter to the, to the head, the CEO of Yarra Trams and said, you really want to go here? And they backed off. And, uh, and I'm, I don't think anyone was listening. I mean, who wants to, who wants to hear poetry? But it was still interesting yeah. about that. You know what I mean? It's, and so why that would was they say that, Michael? Like, why, 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 why? He's a um, white, have this straight thing. male. It's, you have this thing, you don't. It was, that was, it was, I was going to do it anyway. They want to sack me, you're going to sack me. I mean, getting sacked for reading poetry, I mean, that's great marketing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but it's just really interesting. There's, pressures in the community now to shut up and stay silent and and i think that has to be rallied against and rather than just ranting on the side of the street uh to do it through entertainment is, is a very interesting way you know i agree absolutely yeah i've, I've, I've always felt it was a, it's it's a multi-pronged approach and uh, when we when i heard about that's the right. play initially, yep i was really excited because i think that's a fabulous way to do it It'll, you'll reach people that we won't otherwise reach that's right. That's right. And you take it to the country, and I've got I've got uh, country theatres already wanting to have it. The country the the country people will come out and see it too, and they'll love it because it, de it deals with another another issue too that we won't go into now. Uh, but there's um, 
and so I think it's I think it's uh, it's exciting, yeah, and absolutely. I think it's uh, I think it's valid. So yeah, so I'll get this uh, links to you in the next few days. That's if the Cultural Australia allows us to do it, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll go from there and and, oh, no, and we'll, we'll do it. Cultural Australia will fucking allow us to do it. Yeah, <laughs> and John, John and I will get a because uh, uh, I'm really interested in John directing the piece as well. And I, I want to move away from directing a bit so I can concentrate more on the writing. So we'll we'll hammer out a, a, a sort of a budget this week as well. So we'll, we'll know exactly where we are, you know what I mean? And just get the first season up and I think... Uh, know how much we need. We'll go from there. Yep. No, that's great. And as soon as you get that link to us, we'll help circulate that. And I will introduce you to a few people in the UK, Mike Buchanan, Elizabeth Hobson, a couple of well-known people over there um, and others as well. Yep, and there's so many exciting things happening. And at a personal level, I'm looking forward to it coming to Queensland finally. Obviously, being held up by COVID, that's marooned. Uh, yeah, we'll have a go uh, this week too of trying to see if we can get a, another Brisbane gig. Even if we could just yep. get one gig, it'd be fun to fill it. You could you could open the speech and say we help bring it here. You know what exactly. I mean? If you want it'd to. be a great evening. That's right. Yeah, and I know there's That'd so many great. people. There'll be so many people I personally know who would love to see it, and I'm sure that'll be true, absolutely true in the wider community. And we'll uh, we'll help yeah. advertise it here. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know a few people are willing to travel from the mid coast of Queensland to come down to Brisbane to see it. Yep. Well, that was the same when we went to Sydney. The Facebook was full of people from Melbourne going, telling their Sydney friends, "Go see that play." Yeah. And we did two great houses. So, yeah. you know, so I think the same would happen there. We just got to find, 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 find a gig. Find, find yeah. the theater well, you know. As you say, we'll see what we can do over the next week or two and get it, get something locked in. Yeah, Check great. out Twelfth Night, Night, Robert. Check what out Twelfth Night. See what the hell's happening at Twelfth Night yeah. Theater. I, I sent a link. I sent a series of links to uh, to to Michael. I might have included Twelfth Night in it, but I'll double yeah. check. Absolutely, it is. Yeah. It is a very well known Queensland. I've been, I haven't been there for many many a years. Them, a lot of them are book solid, which is one of the issues. It's finding one that actually has space. We, I mean, we can do it midweek, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights are really good for us because the Friday, Saturdays are always gone. But Marooned actually does really well on those nights, you know. Yeah, yeah. Got some other thoughts, actually. I won't say anything now, but I've got some other thoughts about given the nature of Marooned and how you can put it on, you know, and, and I guess I could, you can almost say pretty much anywhere. I've got yeah, some additional Hall, thoughts. Right. Exactly. I've got we some additional thoughts back. about places we could put it on, actually. Yeah, we've been taking Magnolia to town halls around the state. We did three of them. We bring the lights and everything, and uh, the people love it. We filled up the halls. It was a great night. You get a bar going. I think, I think actually that's one of the great things about your mm. plays, Michael, is bar is um, the, the, the setting, the stage setting is very basic. I mean, Marooned is ultra basic <laughs> but that's part of the that's part of the character of it but with magnolia tree and what i envision for real is it's just one set and real is magnolia pretty tree it was it was just an old woman's land room like you you could pick oh yeah that, that was room. important that was important we needed to have an old it needed to be a nice safe looking old woman's lounge room yeah like there was crochet drugs and a, a French crocheted lace um, covering over the back of the land. So it was, it was this very organic. We real even found a, a wooden sculpture of Australia full of teaspoons. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> now that is Australian. In an, op in an op shop uh, on the way to a uh, sale. So that's the real going to be traveling. To. Yeah, real's going to be the same thing. It's a, it's, it's going to be. Something that you recognise, but a very basic, like stage setting. There's not going to be anything. There's not going to be fireworks or bows and ribbons or anything like that. It's mm. just it's going to be what you see every day. Yeah, yeah. It's more theatre. It'll be very simple because there's several locations in real. <clears throat> Ken's house, their house, um, where Lang is and um, ultimately the car and all the rest of that stuff and the all-important chess piece, which mm. Michael and I have talked about and I've had an idea about that. Uh, that so you can, you can see how um, 
tangible it's going to be. It's it's not going to have to. You're not going to have to put on special effects for it or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I know that, that, and that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I I know when we were talking with uh, Bruce and Andrew uh, about the Shadow and the Hughes, and they, I think they said, "Oh, we've only got five thousand dollars for the set." And I was like, holy fuck, that's, <laughs> that's like more of my whole yeah, set put together. I still don't even think I've had that much money. <laughs> and Bruce is sitting there going, oh, that's not much. <laughs> and you're he's sitting there done, thinking, I've just hit the jackpot. <laughs> yeah, you just done Macbeth at the opera or something with, you know, the Opera Australia where they got money coming out from everywhere. So that was really funny. But, uh, but yeah, but no, the, that's, done, that's done. And the other thing too I like about that, especially with Marooned Robert, is like a marooned or even real, you can get small groups putting it on in Queensland. Yes. You don't need us. Yes. Yes. You get a small Another group actors together, go put it on, there you go, boys, off you go. Yep. You know? Yep. And that's that's um, the other beauty about it. Yeah. No, we'll we'll be I'll be in touch after this and we'll we'll have a chat about venues in Queensland. But uh right. I think we've we've probably gone over our original projected yeah. half an hour. <laughs> no, oh, just uh, a little go on, John. <laughs> I said just a little bit. Oh, just a little bit, yeah, no worries. <laughs> so we probably should uh, probably should wrap it up for the better writer and actor. No muzzles. <laughs> and uh, can I just say too, unusually for me, and, and Natalie will uh, will will, will uh, sort of verify this. I haven't quoted one fact or figure all night. That's pretty unusual <laughs> for me. So. <laughs> Very good. I, I nearly did, but not quite. So. I'm amazed hey, you got I have to monopolise the conversation, <laughs> which I usually do. <laughs> well, I haven't been able to get Michael to shut up. You know, I'm trying to get <laughs> myself. That's Thank Michael. you very much, guys. Michael, it's great to, to talk to you again. John, lovely to meet you. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming on the show. Very really, really, really good. Really lovely. Really and appreciate you too, Natalie. And I will Thank see you guys. you guys soon. Yeah, so I look forward to seeing Real again. You will. Uh, yeah, me too. In yeah. a real... Okay. Oh, Get sorry. ready. Real's okay. coming. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Get ready. Real is coming. Real is coming. That's a good thing. Real is coming. <laughs> real is coming. Click real on like coming. and subscribe. Use the YouTube algorithm. Blah blah blah. And we'll see you next week, guys. Okay. Right. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.